Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 59, Three's Company, Kids Edition. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Uh, today we've got a question looking for some great three-player family games for playing with a toddler. In addition, I am going to be giving a first thoughts review on something, and I'm drawing a complete and total... Oh, Tyrant of the Underdark. Thank you. This just shows that I didn't script this part. And then we're going to do our usual weekly look back where I've got a couple games, Emotep and some Tante Core. Tonto Core. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Uh, we'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of online. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, so if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, up first, a comment about last week's show about problematic content in games. I should say potentially problematic content in games. Emmett O'Brien writes, I just saw an ad for Ms. Monopoly, and it sounds as problematic as it could be. For one, Monopoly was supposed to be a protest against capitalism out of control. This is putting a Ms. in front and celebrating it? What's the message here? Then they specifically advertise that women get more money for passing go. Okay, maybe they're looking to flip the patriarchy. But what message comes out to players, especially kids? Are a brother and sister going to get into arguments over how the sister only won because she got more money? And what happens if the brother wins? What message does the sister walk away with? Well, thanks for the comment, Emmett. We actually had a bit of chat of this very topic and product last week in the after show. Uh, patrons will get that audio. And we are no less disgusted than you. Monopoly has, for years, been desperately pumping out various versions to try and convince everyone to buy at least one copy of their product. But this foul ball towards the feminists is, I think a lot of people will agree, a misstep of greater than normal proportions. Yeah, I totally agree. This and their Monopoly for Socialists or Socialist Monopoly, that one I found even worse. Now, Andrew Dacey had this to say about last week's episode. Really enjoyed this one and thought you guys handled it well in terms of stressing consent when it comes to problematic content and making sure you've got that enthusiastic consent. Thanks, Plus, Phil. how the gaming industry can do a better job when it comes to historical context. Good stuff here. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I'm really glad to hear some positive feedback from that episode. Um, I was hoping people would think that our conversation on problematic content would be worthwhile. And I was hoping to hear some things. Unfortunately, I think our timing was a little off because Monty Cook happened to drop a big bomb on the gaming industry on the exact same day. And I think people are thinking we're trying to piggyback on that. And that's not the case. This We had this topic before that even happened. And we weren't trying to become part of that mess. Uh, but it is glad to hear that some people have listened to the show. And the feedback I've gotten so far has been 99% positive. Keith Day... Oh, wow. Keith Day... Keith J. Davies also commented about our last Ask the Bellhop topic. Uh, this time it was over on YouTube. And this was about the start of our show, where we were more talking about Tante Kore. The censorship rules in Japan actually come from rules instituted on Japan by the U.S. at the end of World War II. Short form, it was the side effect of the Constitution of Japan being rewritten. Changes were made leading to an interpretation that uncensored porn was illegal. So they found ways around it, including things like tentacles and things that are, as I understand it, illegal over here. Well, thanks, Keith. Yes, the post-moral measures that led to the odd to us censorship seemed a bit outside of our main thread last week, but you've hit yes. the nail on the head with that summary, I really must say. Now, we also got a lot of positive comments about our initial thoughts on Imhotep. Uh, most of them were just people agreeing that it's a great lightweight game and it does have some meat to it. I'm not going to read them out because there was about five or six people who just kind of chimed in to say, yep, thumbs up, I agree. 
Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, interacts, and uh, takes part with our content. Now, we start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell in an off the books after show. So, uh, people are already sort of talking about uh, a little bit about last week and uh, stuff that happened there. We've had some uh, people having bad days and just getting it off their chest. Uh, we'll take we'll take all kinds of conversations in our chat room. Yeah, we just don't welcome the trolls. I got to thank Sean and our moderator for taking care of a small problem at the beginning of the show. Now, I'm not sure if anyone in the lobby tonight has been gaming with toddlers lately, but if you have, what I want to hear tonight is what you've been playing. And I want to know if it's been good, bad, if you found great games, or if you're still stuck playing old favorites, like um, the one Sean played with his kids that I don't remember the name of because I try to wipe it from my head. Candyland. Uh, Candyland, yep. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> well, we'll be back stopping by the lobby later on. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come to us is through the website. That way they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we're, ta we're back to talking about kids' games. Dylan Zimmerman writes, question for you. Friend asked me, as the board game person she knows, she's looking for games that for three that can be played with a toddler aged third player. What was good with your family around that age? Well, thanks for the question, Dylan. Uh, let's see if we can hook your friend up with some great board games for playing with a toddler. But first, I want to start with our usual disclaimer. Whenever we're giving recommendations for kids, I think this needs to be said. All kids are different. They learn at different rates, and children of the same age may have widely different skill levels. Like, to be honest, this is one of the things that shocked me as a parent when my second child came around. Just how different my two girls are, and how they've been as they grow up, and where they hit various milestones has been so completely different between the two. We're both parents with experience in this, but we're also both privileged white males with all the baggage and privilege that entails for us and our families. Now, because of the fact that everyone's kids are different, it's really hard to tell you like what the perfect game is, what the perfect three-player game is for your family. In general, though, what I do suggest is start off simple. Start with the easy games, just one or two gaming concepts you're going to introduce to your toddlers, right? Like counting or colors or matching or taking turns or something like that. If your kiddo seems to be rocking it, move on to something more complicated. There are going to be toddlers out there that are going to be happy with just rolling some dice or maybe matching some colors. And while we've all heard the stories about that one gamer parent whose three-year-old plays Power Grid, both are valid and cool. Just don't be that parent that forces the heavier and heavier games on their kids because the parent wants someone to play with. Base this on the child's enjoyment and skill level, not yours. If you're gaming with a young child, you should be gaming for that young child, not for yourself. So tonight, I'm going to suggest some games of various skill levels. I'm going to start off with five games that we bought and played with our girls. And then I'm going to talk about some other great looking games that either weren't out or we didn't find or were games that, that weren't available locally or we just hadn't heard about when our kids were younger. Now, Dylan is specifically looking for three player games. Every game we're going to talk about is great with three players. The thing is, most of them are going to be great with more or less than that as well. So this ought to be list 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 ought to be useful for anyone looking to play some games with toddlers. Now I'm going to start off, and these are going to go in progression of simple to difficult. Though difficult meaning uh, more complicated is a better word than difficult. These none of these games are difficult. But we're going to start off with the simpler one. So like I said, if you're going to start off, start off with something simple, and then move on to something more advanced. We're going to start with the simple side. And I'm going to start off with two games from Blue Orange Games. Now, Blue Orange Games is a fantastic company, great kids games, as well as great games for adults. They kind of do the whole gamut. They tend to stick to family weight games over heavy Euros, but they were great when my kids were little, especially my first one was born. They were the company that we found first, like the first non-mass market game manufacturer that we discovered as parents. They make great looking games for kids that all have amazing bright colored components. They're all made of wood. And the two games I'm going to mention even came in wooden storage boxes. Yeah. 
while they're becoming more mass market, some of the younger aimed products can be, still be a little bit harder to find mm -hmm. compared to their adult counterparts. Now, in Canada, at least, Mastermind Toys or Scholar's Choice are both great uh, stores aimed at the educational and, and teacher market mm -hmm. and are great places to go for those younger aimed products that you can't always find on shelves. And also, your local friendly local game store should be able to get in Blue Orange games because of the fact they also do modern hobby work, right? They're behind Planet, which I've raved about 100,000 times on the show. So that's also a good source. You probably won't find them at your uh, Toys R Us. Yes, we still have those in Canada. Um, or uh, Walmart or Target. For those, uh, those, I don't know if we have in Canada. We don't have them here anymore. I think they're gone out yep, of the country. All gone. Yeah, that's what I thought. They were out of Windsor quick. So anyway, Blue Orange Games. So the first of the two recommendations I have from them, and I got to admit, this is not an amazing game. When you're at toddler level, you're not going to get the games that are also great for parents. But thankfully, I find these games tolerable as a parent. And the first one's Ben Domino Jr. This is a super simple matching game with curved dominoes where you're matching pictures and colors instead of pips. And it's Pictures and colors all match. So, like, it's always the same picture on the same color. So, it's not even like you're matching two different things. It's about as basic as it goes. This one plays just as well with two, three, or four players. Uh, what I do recommend, though, is if you try this with your toddler and they get it really quickly, consider moving up to just Ben Dominoes instead of Ben Domino Jr. Uh, this also Blue Orange Games. And this just uses standard domino styles with pips on them. So, then you're tying in counting skills as well as matching. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a, a great game, and the the shapes are fun. So even if you're yep. even if they're they're ready for dominoes, the the fact that you're getting the curly shapes as opposed to just the straight lines as dominoes makes a huge difference, uh, yep. and, and keeping them interested. Plus, the curves do matter a bit because you can't come curve back on yourself, so it does add a little more strategy than instead of just matching. Now, my second Blue Orange game recommendation is a game called Bingery, spelled like bingo with R Y at the end. Now, this is a memory game with a twist where your typical memory game is a bunch of tiles or cards and you flip one and then flip another. If they match, you keep them. This isn't like that. This instead, you're trying to find the four images that are on your personal bingo card. Again, this is a wooden card, like a wooden player board. And then you're going to flip a tile, and if it matches your bingo board, you catch it, and the first person to fill their bingo board wins. What I actually liked about this, and I found my kids got way more engaged in this than memory, was because... They were only looking for four shapes, like the four symbols that are on their board, so they could focus on that. And man, seeing how excited they would get, like I have two sisters, right? When one would, the other one would flip over the one the first one needed, like, oh, you found my thing. And then trying to remember where that is. I thought that that was the, the real draw to this, which like for my girls was way better than any of the typical card-based memory games. Now, this one is pretty. There's no question there. It's really great components. And, and while fun... I, I'm not sure if it doesn't have a shorter, enjoyable lifespan than a normal memory game. Now, again, based on my kids, my kids tended to play memory games solo. And honestly, okay. we'll still, to this day, at 12 and 10, pull out the old memory game we have and play it. So, again, this is one of those things where everyone's kids are different. Um, and you just need to find out what's going to be right for your kids. So, up next... I have a game called Laundry Jumble. Now, I have to apologize for this one because this was my kids' favorite game. They loved this game, but it seems to be very out of print. Uh, this game is hard to describe because it's this washing machine that's kind of cube-shaped, and it's made out of uh, some kind of material, not fabric, but like that, I don't know, plasticky material. And then it's got felt over like where the clothes would go and your hand can go in it. And then it comes with a bunch of um, small articles of clothing in different shapes and sizes, and they're all made of different fabrics and textures. Each turn, the players draw a card and then reach into the laundry machine and try to pull out the matching article of clothing. So they're trying to find like the jacket or whatever. And of course they have to watch out for the skunk sundies, which man, did my kids think that is hilarious. Yeah, we did mention this one in a previous episode, episode and we really haven't been able to find it. Now, I did find a store online that claims to have it in stock, and that's Kidit, K-I-D-D-I-T dot com, uh, and just slash laundry, laundry jumble. But whether or not they actually have that in stock, because a lot of uh, uh, websites advertise the game, mm -hmm. but don't have it in stock. This one actually says they have stock of it. 
Oh, you know? It's possible. It's it, in my guess. It would have to be new old stock. Like I don't think yeah. this game is currently being made. No, it but is there could be an old not. toy store that's just been around for forever. Yep. And that was Laundry Jumble. Got to remember. We got to mention the name of the game at the end of talking about it. I got to try to remember to do that because I hate it when other podcasts don't do it because I always tune in part way through and I'm like, what game were they talking about? Oh, they didn't say it again. We'll try to get better at that. I got to start doing that in the show notes. All right. Uh, the way I think this is pronounced is Panda Bo. It's all one word. It's Panda B-O, not Body Odor. That'd be a very different game. I guess then you need the laundry game. So Panda Bo. Uh, this is from Hate, which is a company I always get confused with Haba because Haba, Hate, they're three letter words and there's literally like two letters difference. They just look similar. There are also companies that both are companies that make wooden toys and also do kids games. So this one's from Hape, H-A-P-E. Uh, panda Bow is a very simple dexterity game where you have this rounded panda meeple. It, it's it's large. It's it's not meeple size. It's big. This is this panda that's laying on its back, and its back's round, so it kind of wobbles. And you're putting sticks of bamboo onto it, and you're trying not to be the player that causes the panda to tip over. Uh, sticks are various lengths, thicknesses, and weights, and there's a die used to determine how many sticks are placed each turn. Uh, personally, I think this is a great intro to stacking style dexterity games, that the pieces are big enough and easy to manipulate where it's good at a toddler level. Instead of going to something that I think you need probably a preschool or a grade school level that are some of the, the more fiddly dexterity games, say like Gokuku, which is not on this list. Now, to be fair, Amazon seems to confuse Hape and Haba as well, so your searches will get muddled. Now, this one, depending on your child's physical level, can be played from very early mm. on. Though, if you go early enough, you might want to skip the die aspect for the child and either do that for them or just pick things up. Uh, and then once introduce the die mm. a little later on. And that was Pandabo. All right. So we mentioned Haba. I want to talk a bit about Haba because Haba to me now is the first place you should look when trying to find great games for toddlers. This wasn't the case when I, when my kids were young, just they weren't available, but, and they've released more games in North America. So this is a German company. It was a German toy maker that expanded out into the world and started making kids toys. Now, in this case, they do only do kids toys. Uh, like even the games are, are targeted at kids and they have learning games. But what they have is a line called my very first games that these are perfect for toddlers. Like literally you could just go to Haba and buy all the my very first games. And that could be the entire list for today's episode. Now, this didn't exist when my girls were young, so we didn't get to check them out. Uh, these very first games. But the game we did get, which is something that this is probably the highest on the skill level. This one's going to take some some teaching and some advanced skills. And that's a game called Monza. This is a racing game from Haba. I, in the game, the players roll a set of dice and the dice have colors on them. And then they're going to match the colors on the dice to spots on the racetrack. And then they can move their car forward, assuming they have the right matching dice. So you're trying to line your dice and patterns and match patterns on the racetrack to get your car ahead. Now, this not only teaches colors and rolling dice and taking turns, but also pattern recognition and planning ahead. Because you may see a really simple move now that actually puts you in a bad place later or you can plan ahead and take a little shortcut now so you have a better move later to me this is the game that kills Candyland. if you just want to you play you play a color to move on a color this is the, the the advanced version of that that's more fun of all the games we talked about this is the one that i say is the most engaging for adults to play as well there is a an actual game here more than just matching things or trying to get colors now Going back to the Haba, what I found is fantastic. Even if you're not going to buy from Amazon, even if you hate Amazon, if you go to Amazon and search for Haba, that's H-A-B-A, -A, down the side, they have a list of appropriate age ranges. And so you just, if you're looking for something, you go, you search by Haba, click on that age ring box, and you're going to find some amazing options. And you'll that, they automatically include hate because Amazon gets them confused as well. <laughs> So you get the full list of Haba and Hape ranges for your uh, age range that you're looking for all in one search. It That's works a, out great. There, there's a life hack for you or gaming hack, a game hack. That's a good one. That's excellent. All right. So those are the, the, the five games that my girls played and had a great time with. Like I, these were all surefire wins. So the next five games I'm going to mention aren't games we owned but are rather games that I would be looking at picking up if I were buying games for a toddler now. 
Now, the first two come from that whole my first games line from Hobbit. Like I said, you could basically use that as a shopping list. Uh, the number one, my first game that I think you'd, I'd want to pick up is Animal Upon Animal. This is an extremely simple stacking game using cute wooden animals. Uses a die roll to determine which animal you have to stack. Like, I actually recommend this no, now over Panda Boat for first dexterity games because these are much chunkier. These, these are basically almost building block size animals you're stacking. And then I also strongly recommend the regular Animal Upon Animal game for when your child's ready to move on. And I would just go buy that now because it is so fun to play with adults that you may as well just have it in your collection. And then when your kids moved on from my first Animal Upon Animal, you're like, here, you want to try daddy's version? Here's the adult version of Animal Upon Animal. Because that game is great. Like, I, I play that regularly just with friends. So the full name of this is Haba Animal Upon Animal Small and Yet Great! Exclamation mark. Because okay. searching animal on animal might not be something you want in your search history. Just saying. Animal upon tends to be a little <laughs> better. The the um, people who, who do the other don't tend to have quite as good grammar. There you go. <laughs> if you search on Amazon, though, you'll, you'll probably find both. Now, my second very first game pick would be a game called First Tortured. Uh, this game has been around for 30 years in Germany. is just starting to be popular here. And this comes from everyone's recommendation. And everyone being... Like all my social media feed, because anytime I talk about kids games, someone points out that this is the first game I bought my kids and it was amazing. What's great about this game is that it's cooperative and you don't find that in kids games very often. And especially at that age, I know my girls were all about, I want everyone to win. We want to together and it's great to see kids board games supporting that. But had I been able to find this in Canada back when my girls were younger, I'm certain I would have picked this up. Not only great as a game, but it's also fun for free play. And uh, the the game actually comes with instructions and or not instructions, but you know guidelines for playing mm -hmm. as uh, as playing with it as free play. And that was uh, first orchard. And next, I have I think it's pronounced Zimbabos because there's two B's, the I M B B O S with an exclamation mark. So it's Zimbabos or Zimbos. Now, a local game store, a friendly local game store that closed up shop quite a few years ago. I miss you, Huni Munin. I uh, used to have this game on display in the store. And anytime I went to the store with my girls, they rushed over to this game and started playing with these great zoo animal shaped blocks. And I honestly can't tell you anything about this game. But my kids were obsessed with this. They would ask to go to the store to play with the zoo game. Uh, this is by Blue Orange Games. So, again, that gives it a thumbs up. Because, you know, it's Blue Orange is going to be a solid game. Kids were hooked on this game before we even brought it home. So think gamified card tower building, but with big child-friendly elephants. I mean, how can you go wrong? And that was Zimbos. <laughs> All right. This one gets a shout out to someone in our chat room. Hoot Owl Hoot. This one actually comes recommended by one of our Patreon backer, Brian Kurtz. Uh, this is a cooperative game that's great for young children. In this color co coordinated matching game, players work together to help fly owls back to their nest before the sun comes up by playing cards of the appropriate colors and acting in the proper order. Now, my only complaint about this one is I gotta say, I don't like the look of it. It's a really drab looking game. And what I was thinking would be an awesome upgrade for this is if you go pick up some plastic owls, some toy owls, like those ones from Slitch or Slitch or however that's pronounced, you can now find those everywhere. Or even like the 10 cent bottle of animal, you can find some of those with owls in it. I think that would just kick this game up a notch. But the gameplay supposedly is great. I have not tried this myself, but every time I talk about kids games, including tonight in our chat, Brian points out how good Hoot Owl Hoot was for his kids. Yeah, no, and uh, I have to say the, the comments on BGG back it up. Um, you know, it's not a difficult game, obviously, um, and it's not super high rated from games. But you know what? The people who are on there are saying, you know, this is great for kids. This is great for kids. This is great for kids. Granddaughters, kids. Yeah. You know, it's just well. Yeah, unfortunately, my, my kids, it seems like they're too old for it. The age range definitely is in the lower, the lower preschool. And my kids are well past preschool at this point. And that was Hoot Owl Hoot. All right. Last game on my list. Uh, this is Pengaloo. This is a memory and color matching game from Blue Orge Games. Uh, this has won a ton of awards. There are so many gold stickers on the front of this box, you almost can't see the art. Uh, it includes the Dr. Toy Award, the Best Toy Award. Um, there's a ton. 
Uh, the main mechanics here are dice and memory, but there's also an advanced set of rules, which is the complete opposite of that co-op thing. And this is adding take that. So this is something I would think is for to more advanced toddlers or toddlers at a more advanced skill level. I shouldn't say more advanced toddlers, but some are who are ahead and who enjoy that extra level of competition. Because in this one, you can steal eggs from another player, which gets that whole stealing from each other, which I know is something my kids would have hated. Now, I haven't tried this one myself, but man, do the components look awesome in this game. Yeah, I have to say, if I was picking up a memory game for my family, this would probably be more what I went to as opposed to uh, Bingery. Yeah, Bingery was definitely like age two and three. Like that yes. was the, the very easy, almost like that's when we're teaching things like taking turns okay. right <laughs> at that point. And that was Pengaloo, the last game in our list of games for... Uh, kids and uh, yeah, let's check Free back into the lobby. Good with toddlers. Yeah. So uh, Brian has also recommended Hiss. That's Hiss with three S's and I believe an oh, exclamation mark uh, from Game Right. I've heard of that one. I know. I, I think that's another cooperative card based game, but I have not played that one. Yeah. From what another one I was thinking is probably good is uh, Orchard instead of my first Orchard which I guess is a good version of Hi-Ho Terrio, which we grew up with, which I remember liking Hi-Ho Terrio as a kid, but if I remember correctly, literally you're just spinning a spinner and like it, it's it's not predetermined, but it's 100% random. But I remember loving the components and playing with the cherries. Um, another one that Deanna recommended, there was one, there was an honorable mention. I know she threw it in the chat and I'm missing it. Oh, yes. Uh, Sleepy Princess Pile. Yes. yes. Oh, Sleepy, Sleepy Princess, Princess Pile. Pile Up. Pile Up. From Hava. Which, oh my God, looks so cute. I, I don't know how the game's played, but it looks like you're trying to put different cushions on top of the pea and not having the bed fall over. That's my guess. Um, there was another one she linked that was a dexterity guy on Amazon earlier today that looked really neat, too. Maybe she can drop that one to the chat. Yeah, was, I got to admit, for doing this particular topic, it was difficult because when I first started answering this question in my head, I was thinking of games for preschoolers and early grade school. And I was totally going to talk about Goku, King of the Dice, and some of these modern games that I got to try. Uh, there's a game from Haba, Dragon Valley, I think it's called, and it's all about there's a bunch of crystals trapped in ice and the mama dragon breathes on them and you bet on how many crystals. and They all look great. And Deanna's on the point where she's like, whoa, whoa, you're thinking too old. Because you got to remember, kids can choke, and they're going to put these in their mouth. And she reminded me about uh, little G, because she had an oral fixation when she was younger and would put everything in her mouth. And we had a few scares over the years. So uh, I had to adjust the list. So it was actually a little more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I'm like, oh, wait. Uh, also, the uh, the Sleepy Princess pileup also goes by the name Sleepy Princess and the P. Okay. So it's... Uh... I see Brian has corrected me. Sorry, Hiss is competitive. Components are cardboard, but they're sort of like cards. So you match colors of snake segments. If you complete a snake, the head, body, a variable length, and a tail, then you win that snake. Goal is to win the most snake tiles. Okay, that's totally not the game I was thinking of. There is a card game people have recommended, a, a cooperative kids card game. And, snail uh, and Race. A Ravensburger's Snail Race, yeah. Yeah, that one's like 50 on Amazon. T Tabletop Deals was sharing that one today. Uh, interesting when I, when I was actually, uh, looking up, looking up Hi-Ho Cherry, uh, games that have not aged well, they did a VHS version of Hi-Ho Cherry. A VHS version? <laughs> how many, how many VCR VHS games did they come out with that are just completely useless now? Not that they were all that useful in the first place, to be honest, but. Well, yes. Uh, yeah. There's, was... uh, Flip Flory, is it? No, it's Bruce Vogue of the. Oh, I feel bad. I'm forgetting names here of other podcasters, and I know this. The Party Game Cast, featuring the Party Game Cast. Right. Where they talk about party games, and they have a one of those TVs with the VHS player in it, and they bring it to cons, and they play these games. And I guess one of the best ever is the Tar Star Trek The Next Generation VHS game, I guess is like phenomenal. And then the old classic Atmosphere and Dragon Strike, a D&D &D game, and they actually bring them out. So one Deanna wanted to recommend to me earlier was Znoet, Z-N-O-E-T, sliding board game that I got to say looks really cute. Uh, she dropped a link in the chat. It's not cheap, 
but it's this sliding game where you're trying to slide pogs into the appropriate sliders. There's a bunny, a dog, and I, I think that's a lion or a tiger. Uh, li- that's got to be lion. Got to be. Yeah, it's got to be a lion. With yeah, bunny, that. dog, you're and trying, lion. You're trying to slide them into the appropriate slot. Yeah, like really cute for a kid's dexterity game, but not cheap. Yeah, it it, it is really well made. It's a folding case. Um, so yeah, it's not surprising that it's it's pricey because it's uh it's quality worksmith. Yeah, it looks really good. Workmanship. Yeah. And we when we were that old, we played with my parents' version of um rebound. Yep. Yep. Which we totally could have choked on those pieces. <laughs> Thankfully we didn't put a lot of stuff in our mouths. Yep. All right, so that's it for this week's Ask the Bell Hop. If you'd like to read more game, gaming, and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on gaming advice. If you've got questions for us, remember, head to the website, click on Ask the Bell Hop, or just fire us with an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We can always use more questions. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever or however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we've released in the week's previous blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and now a ridiculous number of YouTube videos that we create each week. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. I do have to welcome the new members to the newsletter from the Burn the Tavern Down newsletter. They did a shout out just like I did a shout out from them and we did get a, a rash of new members. So that was pretty Excellent. cool. They just got to get you all to listen to the show and join us live here on Twitch. All right, the last Wednesday of every month, it's official, we're going to be hosting a live AMA right here on Twitch. Join us September 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, where we'll answer your game or gaming night questions right here live. Uh, We'll be taking questions from our chat room right here on Twitch, as well as watching Twitter for questions to come from there. Now, speaking of Twitch, you can also join us Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Bellhop 2 team do some live streaming. Now, tomorrow, for those of you here live, Sean and I are going to be playing some Terraforming Mars. That'll be the Steam version. And next week, that's tomorrow, for those of you listening to the podcast, the day it comes out, Sean and I are going to do a live read-through and commentary on the Terraforming Mars Frequently Asked Questions, or FAQ, or FAQ, however you want to pronounce that. So, if you're here live and and going to be available tomorrow, well, come in and watch me get crushed oh, I as I it. fumble through a game I've only ever played on the table once against Mo, <laughs> who's been playing it for years now. The good news is, you can help learn the game right along with me, because the game <laughs> is actually go. a pretty good match of the tabletop game implemented on Steam. As long as we don't add any computer players, because, man, they, they, the AI in that plays so different from any human I have ever played. Like, I played, I don't know how many games of Terraforming. It's in the 30s. It might even be in the 40s or 50s. Games of Terraforming Mars. And I do well enough. I don't always win. Can't beat the damn computer, because it just does stuff that makes no sense to me. But it obviously works, because they win. Like, oh, well, man. And see, that's confusing, because I haven't, I, I mean, not that I've played it many times, but I, I have had at least some success against the computer, so... Well, I've only played twice. So. I may I may end up playing and you'll be wondering what yeah. I'm doing because I've yeah, learned I'm, I'm I've like, learned with the computer. What are you doing like paying to put out lakes? There's cards that do that so much cheaper. That's one of them. They they yeah. like to spend standard projects to raise the terraforming rating. I find that so bizarre. All right. All right. Come level up with extra life. Saturday, September 28th, we are hosting a charity role-playing event at the CG Realm on the corner of Tecumseh and Hall down in Windsor. Now, this event is going to feature a wide variety of role-playing games, including games like Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, Numenera, Paranoia, Kids on Bikes, The Watch, Worldwide Wrestling, and more. We've even got some special guests running games like Terry, that Terry girl Latorco from Renegade Games, and Victoria Rogers from the Broadswords. Of course, the bellhop will be there too. Uh, there are going to be two seatings, one at 10 a.m. and one at 6 p.m. Head over to our Facebook event, uh, link will be in the show notes, to reserve a spot at a table. 100% of the money raised going directly to Extra Life in support of the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Now, one more quick Extra Life announcement. 
We are going to be at Windsor Comic Con this weekend. We're going to be there as part of the CG Rome booth, looking for people to join our Extra Life team and donate to the cause. You can find Tori, Kat, and Ryan on Saturday, and myself and Jeff there on Sunday. Stop by the booth and say hi. That's right. You, too, can say hi to Kator. <laughs> they're coming. They'll be in cosplay. Oh. I don't know what they're doing this year. I'm sure there'll be lots of pictures. All right. Up next, we've got a review of the D&D-themed board game, Tyrants of the Underdark. All right. Tyrants of the Underdark was released by Gale Force 9 in 2016. Now, I don't remember if the game was premiered at Origins 2016, but I know that year it was a big hit. We were happened to be at Origins 2016. It was one of the first times we'd gone. And they were showing this game off. There was a buzz going around. This is, I was one of the many people that, that was excited about it. Like, I'm like, oh, a new D&D board game. And D&D, this sounds awesome. You get to play Drow. This sounds cool. I got to check this out. Uh, this was a Dungeons & Dragons deck building game set in the Underdark pitting drow families against each other. Now, both Deanna and I made time to go check out the game. Well, we didn't actually sign up for any demos. We were hoping to get to check it out that way. We didn't sign up for any, like, official events, right? Uh, we got to the booth, and there we saw the game in a glass case. And I gotta say, like, I was less than impressed. This game has one of the dullest dark boards like so dull that you can barely tell what the art on it is. You can just tell there's art there and it's purpley and blackish and bluish. Um, I, I I don't even know what the picture was. On it are thick, bright white lines connecting boxes. And the boxes are all, some are white, some are black. And then there's some circles of white that have more art inside. But again, the art's so dull, you can barely tell what's inside. They look like cityscapes and stuff. Now, all over this map are all these little tiny shields in really odd player colors like really dark blue gray that's almost the same color as the dark blue a dark red and bright orange and bright white like it was just i don't know the overall impression i got is i felt like i was looking for a war game uh, at a war game like an older war game like i thought i was looking at some new version of risk that was released in the late 80s early 90s like i immediately didn't care like i yeah this doesn't look like anything i'll like at all and and boldly stealing directly from the chat room, would you say the board was under dark? That was over dark. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah, good one, Brian. Uh, yeah, no, I have to say, I, you know, just looking at the box, if if I didn't know anything about it and I wasn't generally interested in drow and or dark elves in the first place, uh, oh, yeah. I have to say, yeah, no, it doesn't really look appearing. Now, no. if you are a drow or dark elf fan, then the game does have a little bit more interest. I mean, it it very does it does feel like those colors are the the D and D drow. I mean, it's a very very heavily drow game, uh, and you know maybe that's forgivable if you're maybe. that super fan. The thing is, there's so much D art out there. Surely they could have found like a map of the Underdark or something for the board. So uh, the week I kept going on, we kept. You know, the buzz was still buzzing and we're like, all right, fine, we're going to do a demo. So Deanna and I went back probably on Sunday or so demo tables were all full and we watched people play. And this short glimpse we saw again, just made me think I was watching another version of risk because I saw someone play a card to put a bunch of new units on the table. Then I saw another person play a card and take some enemy units off and say, oh, I assassinated your guy. So I take them off. Like. Uh, and then there were these little spy miniatures that I guess looked kind of neat. And they were putting out new shields on the board. Cause I guess like the shields are your units, but like, it just, they were expanding their territory. Like it literally looked like I was watching people play a, a, a folk on a map area control game. And I couldn't have cared less. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, you know, looking, even just sitting here, looking through the board game geek, uh, photo listings. Yeah. I can absolutely imagine that's what the game is. Uh, I know it's not from reading Twitter, but <laughs> yeah. uh, but looking at the pictures of the game, yeah, no, I, this is area on area control, meeples on a map. You know, that's yep. doesn't war game because it's drow. Because of course, well, obviously, you're going to be fighting each other. But yeah, but you nailed it there, right? You you said it. That's not what Twitter's saying, and that's it. Since that time, I have heard so many people tell me I should have given this game a chance. Like, I know people online that consider this the best deck builder ever made. I didn't even get to see any deck builder from this demo I saw. 
Every time I share a deal on this through tabletop gaming deals on Twitter, someone points out, oh my God, amazing game, you got to buy it. And thank you, everyone who retweets and comments like that because it helps some more copies. So fast forward to Origins 2019. I've heard all the feedback. I've heard everyone tell me I shouldn't have skipped over this game. So here I am. I'm there. I am there as Tabletop Bellhop. I'm trying to collect review copies of games to bring home. I am there to work. So I went, what the heck? Why don't I go to Gale Force 9 and ask if they'd be willing to give me a copy? Because I still don't trust the game. Based on what I saw, I'm like, I don't know. Do some maps. So this way I don't get to spend any money. And I explained this to him. I said, you know, I admit I skipped it in 2016. I didn't think it looked good. I want to give this game a review and give it a fair shot. And I want to tell people what I think. And they agreed. So I brought the game home. And it's been a while since Origins, but I finally got the game to the table this past weekend. Now, in this game, you are playing the head of a drow, dark elf household. Uh, your goal is to accumulate power through control of the Underdark. This is, uh, for people who don't know the Underdark, it's basically a huge series of dungeons and lairs and cities that are underneath the Forgotten Realms as you know it, which is not the nowadays default D&D setting, but probably one of the more popular D&D settings, even if it wasn't the default. Now, this is done through a mashup of deck building and folk on a map area majority. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm just sort of sort of poking through on uh, board game geek as we learn because I don't I'm still learning about this as you as you explain it so <laughs> all right so basically like every deck builder out there players start off with the same starting deck in this case it's a mix of soldiers that provide power and nobles that provide influence now influence is used to buy new cards this is like every deck builder out there uh each game in the market is created by taking two half decks and shuffling them together i thought that was cool because the base game comes with four decks so you pick two of the four decks and mash them together i thought that was neat uh the first game we played we used demons and dragons and the second game we played drow and dragons now influence lets you buy cards what power does though is that whole board aspect this is all about playing the board elements and the folk on the map game power lets you place troops which are those little shields eliminate enemy troops through assassination and remove enemy spies now the map represents a bunch of underdark sites and they're connected by pathways on many of the sites and pathways start with neutral troops these are the white shields you'll see in all the pictures and the board's pretty stocked with them at the beginning of the game now each of the sites that's on the board so each of the squares and circles is worth points at the end of the game for the player who controls it and that's who has the most units in it and there's also bonus points for having complete control which is owning every spot in a site and some of the sites are one spot and the biggest site is six spots so this i mean again not knowing much about this what I'm hearing here is we've almost got two separate games going on at the same time. You've got a sort of a, a deck building, a, a deck builder and the folk on a map game. Um, are they well, are they well connected? Like, is it, is it, is it integral or is it, is it sort of two separate things you're paying attention to? So it is totally integrated because everything you're putting in your deck is to influence the stuff on the board or to give you more cards to influence stuff on the board better. So uh, with a very slight aspect of also getting points from your cards. But I don't think ignore the board in this game at all. Like uh, the, the points you get from, uh, I don't know, the last two games we actually did get a lot of points from cards. I, it's definitely two things you have to focus on at once. But the two are very much tied together because all of the cards that give you power are just to do stuff on the board. And many of the cards you get are going to give you things like um, spies which are going to let you put spies out of the board. Uh, this gives you presence whenever you put a spy. So this is a good way to be able to move to another side of the board, which is very thematic to me with Drought, because you'll take a spy and you'll play it like on the opposite corner, nowhere near your main army. And then once you've got the spy there, you can start spreading out from where the spy is if they're not removed, which I thought that was really thematic. Um, spies are also used to prevent complete control. But the only way to even put sp card spies in the game is to get a card that says play a spy. Like it's not a basic action everyone can do until they can get a card that lets them do it. And of course the drow deck is filled with spies. Whereas the dragons deck had like maybe one or two. Now there's also a rule called devoured that removes cards from the games. And that again was very thematic because that's what stuff like the dragons and the illithid and the mind flayers did is they devoured other cards. Now in some cases they devoured their own cards. Other times they devoured cards from the, the market. So yeah. that was nothing that wouldn't happen. Um, so when it comes then, to when it comes to devouring, then is that the is that the only way to pull the, to to trim down your deck so you don't get bloated? No, not quite. Because there's also this thing called promotion. 
Now, promotion, interestingly enough, this is completely ironic, and I had no idea there was a tie together, is basically the same thing as chambering a maid in Tonto Kore. Uh, this is only the second time I've ever seen a deck builder that happens to use this, and I happen to review them and play them back to back, which I thought was funny. Uh, what happens when you promote a card is you take it out of your deck and you place it into something called your inner circle, which is just a spot in your playing area. Cards in your inner circle are no longer used, but every card in the game is worth two, two victory points. So you have every card's worth points in your deck or in your hand, and they're worth more points if they're in your inner circle. So the neat thing there is especially a really powerful card, like the dragons in particular are huge. They're going to like assassinate a troop, move a troop on the board, let you play three guys out. But they're also worth like eight points if you promote them. So it's like, how long do I keep the dragon in the deck? Because if I promote it, it's going to be worth a lot of points at the end of the game. Like there's there's a lot of interactions between the two major mechanics in this game working together. And I got to say they're tied together really well. That's interesting. It's really interesting because that really does sound a lot like the the thought process of Tanto Kore, where yes. you're you're trying to play that maid as long as possible before chambering them to maximize their mm -hmm. usage. Yeah, I think I, someone someone that designed this game was had had played Tanto. They must have played Tanto Kore. Like it, it's almost the same mechanic. I, there's no way to make your your um. I almost said chambered. Uh, there's no way to make the cards in your inner circle sick or give them bad habits in this case. There's, uh, but there are cards that do interact with the inner circle, we learned. Um, there were people who would devour things from the inner circle. But as far as I could tell, they all affect your own inner circle. I, I still haven't played with all the decks. So I think that's a pretty good overview of the game. So basically, you're, you're using cards to get more influence, to buy more cards, to give you power, to do stuff on the boards. And then there's all the special abilities that the cards do, right? Like, that, that's pretty much it. Now, I got to say, I still don't like the map I, or the overall look of the game. The map is just boring, doesn't really, to me, give me a feel of the Underdark at all. Uh, the map lines are thick and bright that they take over, so you don't even notice the backboard, which is a pretty good thing for functionality from seeing the board from far away, but just so blah. Like, it's a Dungeons & Dragons game. Like, there's artwork going back to 1974 here that could have pulled from. Um, the units are terrible. Like, the, these little shields. Like, why are, the, why are they little shields? And th they don't stand up well. Like, I actually think I would prefer cubes because these shields fall over all the time. And then they give you the five spies. Now, the spies are awesome. The little drow minis. Why, why couldn't they all be little drow minis? Drows with spears or something instead of spies. I, it's just a weird choice. Throwing the aesthetic away, everything else about Tyrants of the Underdark is fantastic. Like, thankfully, the art on the cards isn't as drab as the artwork on the board. The cards are filled with all kinds of awesome D&D artwork. Uh, every card has flavor text, which is a nice touch. I like that. Uh, speaking of fluff, like flavor text, the rule book is fluff and background, explaining what all the different sites on the map are, which is really cool. So you actually can learn about the drow and the underdark and the sites you're fighting over as well. Okay, so uh, reading through some comments, a couple of things, and I, and, and, and I want to kill your face. Now, when it comes to D&D uh, &D games, uh, my other experience huh. is with um, Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep. And, and in my personal opinion, after my play of that game, I thought, this is a fantastic game. Why do they have to throw all the D&D &D stuff on it and jack up the price? Uh, it very felt like a pasted on theme. Now, I'm yep. seeing some comments about this game referring to that, which which strikes me as strange because it, your description at least feels like it it would be tough to do this to consider this a, a pasted on uh, theme. You you could do it with any theme, okay. like I, it could be any theme. But I think some of the mechanics tie really well to the drow. Like I said, especially the spies. Right. The fact that you build out your empire from over here, but you can put your spy in way over there. Um, the promoting too, because. Drow society is all about saying the people ahead of you and promoting your house and getting people into your inner circle. And that whole inner circle mechanic to me seems very drow like. I promote this drow soldier. He's now part of my inner circle. He's now worth more to me. And it also removes him from the battlefield. He's no longer part of it. To me, I found that thematic. The flavor text adds to it. But like, there's no reason you couldn't change it and make it Star Wars and your spies instead. Well, they could still be spies, right? They could be rebel spies. Yep. You don't have to rename it. And your inner circle can be instead your your empire, whatever, in your rebel HQ, right? Like, right. so it's, it's. I, I got to say, like I said, especially the spy thing and the promoting, I find fits Drow really well. So I think they fit, pick the theme that fits the mechanics well. 
I, I wouldn't say totally paste it on. There's some glue there. <laughs> like there's something there. Well, there's I a have bit to of a say mold. the art would probably be better if it was a Star Trek, a Star, or a yeah. Star Wars theme. That's <laughs> uh, probably um, a nice map of the galaxy would have looked great there. I, I think know. it would have worked. Now, the other thing comment I'm seeing, and now maybe you can't comment on this because I don't, I know you haven't played it too many times yet, but uh, some people are talking about some runaway concerns uh, based on uh, various things like random, uh, you know, random appearance of combos and also which halves of the deck uh, people are starting with. I haven't seen that myself, but I haven't played enough. So okay. what we have seen so far is no one knows who's going to win until the very end and we add up the points. We've never gotten to the end. Like, oh, you won that one. Okay. And then did, we've done that and then did the math and she didn't, for example. So it has felt that way partway during the game. Like there was one game where I knew I'd lost. Like the other players were just always had seven and eight in the market. Uh, speaking of the market, actually, that's something else I should mention. This is one of the few cards I had, I, deck builders I have, that I really like because the cards seem really well balanced with even the low powered cards being very useful. Like the one cost Cobalt is actually a really solid card. It lets you place a troop or assassinate a white troop, a neutral troop on the board. This is one of the few deck builders where. If I have a choice, like if I've done it and I have six influence, I don't just buy the six card. I might actually want to buy two, three cards instead of just buying the six because the two, three cards might be more useful because they'll come up more often in my deck. They'll come up twice as often. And that could become more powerful than the six. As opposed to Star Realms or Ascension, where basically you just buy whatever the most expensive card out there is. Unless you like it's, it's Ascension or Star Realms, like once you really specialize your deck to one color, you might not. But in general, especially at the beginning of the game, it's just I have six. What costs six? OK, I buy the six. I don't even have to read the card. I, I like that. Uh, also, promoting is awesome. It, it's even better than it was in Tante Koro. It, it, that was that was the runaway. That was the, the killer app aspect of Tanto Kore, and this does it better, in my opinion, because you don't have the whole, this card replaces the last card and gets played on top, and you don't have to keep your cards separate. It's just a big pile with more points at the end. Right. And I did like the half decks. I, I couldn't tell you on the balance. I'll say one thing. The demon deck is mean. The demon deck adds a new card to the game, which are insane outcasts. And the demons cause your drow to slowly go insane, and they're worth minus points, and you end up seeding them in your opponent's deck. So that was pretty well done. So I've talked about the deck building, how much I like that. So now the area majority board game. Um, I thought I would like this the least. And I got to say, looking back to 2016, it ends up on, I was wrong. This is not just Risk. Uh, while the board may look a lot like Risk or something like that, it does have some features that set it apart. For one, it's area majority, not area control. Multiple factions can be at the same location at the same time. To me, that's a major difference between area control, where, uh, again, using risk as an example, either you control Africa or you don't. Or, or, well, Africa's big. Either you control Egypt or you don't. I don't care. It shows how often I play risk. I don't even know what the different territories and risk are. You either control a territory or no. It, like, only your troops are in there. And this, you can have all four players can be in the same spot. What matters is who has majority. So that's a different thing. And I like that. Um, and I dig that complete control gives you a bonus. Uh, I found in all the games I played, the very end of the game is people rushing to fill spots. So that's interesting. Uh, another diversion from many standard area majority games is hold the present thing. So the way that works is you can only place troops in an area where you have troops or next to an area where you have troops. And at the beginning of this game, this means you start from your home base and you start spreading. But that changes as soon as you can put a spy on the board because a spy can be placed anywhere on the board and once you place a spy you now have presence on that new area and that is huge you then have presence not only in that spot but all the connecting spots this lets you make inroads to another area of the board that's your home base and this i found very strategically and tactically important and again i think really fits that whole drow suddenly a spy shows up in the enemy city and all of a sudden they're infiltrating over there and all of a sudden troops are getting assassinated it just to me that fit the theme Oh, excellent. I look forward to uh, getting, it, getting it on the table uh, when I get down next time. Yeah, we got to make a list of the deck builders for you to play. Because like I say, right now, this is my favorite board game deck hybrid. There are a few out there. I, I'm putting this above Clank. So there's one board game hybrid. And I would put this way above Trains, which is a, a route building hybrid deck builder board game. I am looking forward to trying the other half deck. I haven't tried the elemental one out. 
And that adds in the whole Star Realm thing or the Ascension thing, where if you play a card of the same faction, you get a bonus. So I haven't seen that in this game. And I still want to try a two-player. I haven't done that yet either. Uh, and once you get through all that, there are expansions or an expansion. There's one expansion, yeah. yeah. Two more two more half decks. Yep. Which I've heard are good. And again, add new mechanics to each of them. Excellent. All right. Well, you can find this review and more like it over on our blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review on tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So, one of the games I did, uh, one of the things I did is this past Monday, I convinced my Monday night game group to give Tonto Core a try. Um, the biggest thing I found with Tonto, this is what I've had the most fun with, is the change in attitude about the game from when the players first see it and sit down to the table and when we finish our first game. And also the fact that every time we finish our first game, people ask to play a second time once they get to see it. Like, as we talked about a lot last week, the theme in this deck building game is unique. Um, I talked about it in the review and our whole last podcast was about the potentially problematic themes in this game. Because in this game, you are playing Japanese uh, head of a household collecting Japanese maids. And I got to say, this theme puts people off when I introduce the game. Now, in most cases, with the people I've shown it to, because they're people I trust and I know well enough that I can present a game like this, is it's usually a matter of some giggling and some suggestive remarks. Um, people don't take the game very seriously at first at all. And despite this, every single case of me teaching the game, by the end of it, the players like do a 180, like a complete turnaround. Players are then commenting not about the art, not about the pillows and the theme, but how good the game is. Like everyone literally seems surprised. They're like, oh my God, there's a really solid deck builder here, despite this rather unique theme. I'm in the exact same boat. I felt the same way the first time I played it. Because this game really isn't just cute anime maids and a bit of fan service, but a solid deck building game that I personally prefer over most of the early deck builders like Dominion. Yeah, I have to say, uh, you know, it the the general sort of overall view of this game seems to be this is a better Dominion than Dominion. And that's uh, sort of what, you know, a, a common theme you see in reviews of this game. And no, that's based Dominion. I, I know Dominion still, they're putting out expansions. People love it. I quit after the second expansion. It just wasn't for me. So compare it to base Dominion. For all you Dominion fans out there, I know the game evolved and big money wasn't always the way to win. And it got better, but I didn't keep up with it. Well, to be fair, Tonto Quarry has evolved too. There are a that's number true. of expansions out there so you can expand your maid game as well. Yeah, that's true. Maybe maybe I'll get Japan anime games to send me those sometime. We'll see. I'm trying to get them to send me the Robotech games. That's what I really want to review from them. That's what I want to check out. The defense of the SDF-1. The giant SDF-1 you put in the center of the table. I want that game. You just want the SDF-1, whether it's a good game or not. Let's be it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> there, there's some, right, there's some childhood memories. With, like, uh, yeah. Chuck, yeah. Robotech's up there with Star Wars from my childhood. That was yeah. a big deal. So after playing Tonto for the first time, with this group of players, I then broke out Imhotep, Builder of Egypt. Uh, this was the first time my Monday night group got to play it, so we just stuck to the A sides of the board. We played a four-player game, went over just as well as it did with the game of Torian that we talked about last week. Now, this past Saturday, I helped facilitate a board game night at the CG Realm. Now, as part of this, I was featuring Imhotep. I had actually hoped to feature Dead Man's Cabal, but sadly, the store has not been able to get copies in, so we haven't been able to pull that off. So instead, I grabbed Imhotep. I, I had my copy of Imhotep there, and I was willing to teach anyone who was interested how to play it. And throughout the night, I ended up teaching two games. Now, the first game, again, I just stuck to the basic building tiles using the A-side, taught two brand new people the game who had never seen it before. Deanna joined in as well, so we had four players. Uh, that game went really well. Now, had the store had the game in stock, they would have sold the copy right then because Chad was impressed. All right, so I think we've we've pretty much established now that you are an Imhotep fan. Uh, you've now yep. played, you know, you've played both sides now, and we'll we'll get into that a little more later. Um, this game's got expansions. Is it is it a good enough game that it's something you'd be willing to invest further in? You know, given 
you know, given the, the ability to invest in anything, yeah. uh, you know, is, is it a good enough game that you want to see where else it goes and how much better and, and, you know, bigger and better? Well, there's only one actual expansion. There's just a ton of add-ons and downloadable and promos. There's one box set that just came out this year, was premiered at Gen Con. I happen to already have a copy of that. So I might answer the one question. What the expansion does the big thing it does is it replaces all the boards. The boards already have an A and a B side. It gives you a C and a D side, which leads you to 1,028 possible combinations for Imhotep. And I got to say, that's pretty cool. If you want replayability in your game, that's that's pretty pretty hard to beat that number right there. Like 1028 possible board combinations is is pretty dang impressive. So yeah, I think it looks pretty good. At this point though, I'm not even going to break it out. I'm still showing people the game. I'm still trying it out. And I've only actually gotten to try the B-sides once so far, which was actually the second time I played on uh, Saturday. So we played a game of Tyrants of the Underdark, the game I just reviewed. And after playing that, uh, we took all the players who played Tyrants of the Underdark, three of us, and we went over and went back to Imhotep. And now this time, we played the B-sides. And what we did is we put all the B-sides out. So... These were all players who had played the A side before, so we put it to the B sides. And I got to say, uh, there's a reason it says try the A sides first, because the B sides were a bit more fiddly than the A sides. And a lot of the sites had triggering actions, so it's like do a thing and then do something else, which immediately adds to the complexity level. Now, for the obelisk, instead of just stacking all your cubes up, you have to wait till you have three. But as soon as you have three, you score. And then the players who do that first get the most points, starting at 10, then 9, and 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. For the pyramids, instead of one pyramid, you're building three smaller ones. Um, and then some of the spots give you actions. Now, these extra actions are things like getting to put a brick on a boat, taking a market card from the top of the deck, getting cards from the quarry ahead of time just for building the, temp uh, the pyramid. Uh, the temple is the most complicated one because now you're still looking from the top to see who gets a thing, but now they get a choice. They either get points or they get something else. Uh, again, the something else is uh, market cards or bricks from the quarry. Burial chamber is still area majority, but it completely changed it. So it's based on rows instead of touching blocks. So instead of area, and then even the market is different. The market has a spot where you can push your luck. So what, instead of having one face up card, it has two face down. So you don't know what they are, and you draw it, and you pick from the two. Well, that's certainly certainly a wider range. Um, I guess, and, and the reason I was asking, I got confused, because I was thinking there's also Imhotep the Duel, but that's actually a separate that's a game. Standalone. That's, that's a standalone. Yeah. yeah, it's a two-player-only version, which I have not gotten to check out. Now, as for the new spots, the B spots, they're just a touch more complicated than the basic version. Well balanced, they seem like they mix well with the other side. So that that's my next thing right? is play the game with someone who's played before. Oh, again, I will only stick to A side with a new player. But as long as I get someone who's played before, I'm gonna mix the A and B boards. I'm literally gonna shuffle them. I'm you know I'll take them, shuffle them somehow, and then throw them out. And I am looking forward to checking out that expansion. But I want to play a couple more times with the B sides before I do that. All right. Now I did mention the other game I played at CG was Tyrants of the Underdark, but you already heard my thoughts on that one in our review segment. <laughs> all right. So uh, I've gotten yeah mostly almost all my games right now are uh, on uh, on board Online. game uh, board game arena. Uh, although apparently I've been doing well in, at least in some of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sean had quite the win in Seven Wonders. I still have never seen a score that high. That was ridiculous. <laughs> I I don't know. I. Yeah, I don't know. And I uh, thought I had it, but I wasn't. You were on the other side of the table. That's the thing I don't like about Seven Wonders, right? Well, like, and that's I can't actually, do anything about the person who's two away. It's actually interesting because I've, I've been thinking, and I, I'm almost always next to D. Like, huh. whenever I'm buying something, it's almost always D. But I, I haven't been used next to you on that game in a very long time. I it's haven't... weird. It's it's you know, just one of those things where I've noticed, you know, every once in a while you go to buy a card and it's like, oh, it's always the same people. Yeah, like I, I've had game time next to me as long as I can remember. Yeah. It switched between Satura and Frostbite. Right. But it's almost always game time next to me. Yeah, it's, it's odd. I don't know why. I'm not sure what they're randomizing. Is, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is, like for that. Uh, like, but, yes, I, I realize in Seven Wonders, you can technically realize that you might be passing something three down to someone, but I don't pay that much. I pay attention to the people next to me. 
Uh, the only thing I pay attention to, I or I've been trying to pay attention to, is science. Uh, is the yeah. uh, you know I try to make yeah, sure is anyone collecting these? Yeah, who's collecting them? Do I need to burn it or mm -hmm. uh, you know steal it? Um. All right. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. For those of you here live and local, uh, join me this weekend. Easy mode. 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. I'm going to be bringing Imhotep. I'll be bringing Tyrants of the Underdark for sure, as well as some other games. Uh, also, stop by the booth uh, for the CD Realm at Comic-Con this weekend. Now, for those of you listening on the podcast next weekend, which is the weekend coming up for you guys, is our big level up event for the CD Realm for Extra Life. I'm going to be running some worldwide wrestling. I still have to put that in the Facebook group. I haven't decided if I want to do a noon session or a 6 p.m. session. We're also doing a big RPG book exchange, something I missed in the announcements. That's, that's uh, 10 a.m., not noon, isn't it? Oh, yeah, sorry, 10 a.m., 10 a.m. Sorry, 10 a.m. <laughs> for the first sitting, 6 p.m. for the second sitting. I still don't know which I want to do. It's not and, the 10 uh, a.m. I'm going to be there the whole time anyway. Just think, if you join in World Wild Wrestling, you too can have a giant microphone that you can yell in while you're role-playing. Yeah. Uh, I won't be giant. It's my old Ars Tech okay. microphone. Uh, I got my old mic from podcasting that it started making noise, which was weird. All right. Uh, and we're just going to hop back into the lobby here for a minute. Uh, Brian actually found at Target, they have reissued Escape from the Death Star from the 80s. What did I say? Classic 80s game? Yes. Wow. And I have to say, uh, the, the he posted the link to it in the uh, the chat room, and yeah. this thing reads like like candy being waved in front of collectors. It's got <laughs> it's got the Grand Moff Tarkin figure, and oh, one geez. of the actual selling points. So there there are there are five highlights listed, and one of them is R two D two depicted on spinner. <laughs> like that is a that is a you know right there the quote. R2-D2 depicted on Spinner, the Star Wars Escape from Death Star game, includes a spinner featuring an image of R2-D2. Like, I, th I think they must have taken the flavor text or the, the, the sales text from the 80s. But they probably <laughs> did. And it, uh, it, I, that was one I did not have when I was a kid. Uh, I, had a, I had a different one where you had little X-Wings on a base. I don't remember what it was called. And apparently this was actually originally released in 1977. So it was right wow. on the heels of the... Uh, yeah. That would have movie. been the original movie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this game is for ages eight and up, but uh, you probably want to be a lot older than that if you want to actually enjoy the game. Yes, uh, and you're, <laughs> you're only going to enjoy it for nostalgia's sake. I would... Nice looking Tarkin figure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very classic Kenner Tarkin. Um, yeah. all right. I never had a Tarkin either. Well, I think that's probably why. It's probably... Yeah. yeah. And now... A quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Wayne, the Star Wars guy, Humphrey, who's probably well listening to this rushing to Target right now. No, who am I kidding? He still got his original copy. I actually want to thank him for my love of Gokuku. I would have never picked up that game if Wayne hadn't pointed it out. So you can blame him for me talking about that game way too much. All right, Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Sue, see you Sunday at Comic Con. William Fisher, thanks. Danielle Thomas, thank you. Major Kayla. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and I'm going to have to lock those front doors. Though so the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30, where they mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then, we'll surprise you with something else. Like this Friday. Now, this wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show, and if we've got enough people, our new tradition of raiding another Tabletop Gaming Twitch streamer <laughs> at the end of the night. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.